Um, so yeah, I was fortunate enough to be here last year when we, uh, I guess, introduced our strategy around uh, taking uh, design to fabrication through to construction on the Revit platform, uh, and more specifically on a single model authoring platform. And um, I guess I, I sort of spoke to some of the challenges um, that we saw in industry that was driving our decision to do what we were doing with Revit in particular, but with our MEP product portfolio at large, and about some of the sort of trends that are beginning to emerge around the world, as we saw them at the time, that, you know, again, ultimately drove out the picks and clicks that, you know, end up in the product that you use, or products. And I, I suppose I spoke to these four specifically, top left modular prefabrication, which you know, pretty much everybody is doing now in some way, shape, or form. And we've seen a lot of that already over the last couple of days. Um, what's interesting is this really, at least I don't see any real standards emerging around this internationally. So I think that's perhaps you know, where we need to go next. I talked a little bit about sort of materials, new materials. This is cardboard ductwork and you know, the efficiencies around in, you know, improved installation capabilities. I talked a, bit, a little bit about drones that were just beginning to sort of emerge at that time. And I guess this bottom right one was really more about um, sort of mobile devices and, and the fact that they were becoming more prolific within the uh, construction space. I thought it would be interesting to go back and just take a look over the past 12 months and see what's happened. Are these still the trends? Are we seeing other things? Um, one of the first things that I have started to notice is the use of drones uh, has really increased. Uh, this is an example. Uh, from a company called Tikab in the Nordics, and um, they're basically using drones with our recap software to pull um, that um, information into Revit, and then use that as a basis for, for modeling. Uh, and as I talk to people actually here the last couple of days, as well as around the world, um, I see two sort of uses for drones starting to emerge. One is the obvious one, which is um, existing conditions for either as-builts so when the building has been built, this is actually perhaps a more accurate way of getting your as built potentially than the model that may have changed. Um, or of course refurb, if you're, you, know, you have a, an older building that you, you, know, you need to scan and, and develop further. So and that's something that's really attracting, I guess, the design end of the business. When we look at detailing and contractors, they're starting to use it, particularly in North America, to track what's being installed on almost a daily basis. You know, we heard Tim earlier talking about sort of what they're doing um, around that space. And this is one solution that certainly some contractors have looked at because they can send these out at the end of the day. They can, they can record what's been installed and they can very quickly update the status of elements. And so that's what we're beginning to start to see. It's certainly not everybody's doing it, but there's, there's some evidence of, of that happening. Um, and it's great to see the, the guys outside with their drones. Um, is anybody actually using drones here? Show of hands? No? Okay. Um, so I think this is definitely still an emerging trend, and, and there's uh, you know a lot of uses for it, and it's proving uh, it's proving very uh, very very efficient. So ultimately, once you've edited the uh, the imagery that you get here, you can just quickly pull that straight into into Revit, which we'll see in in just a moment here, and you can uh, start to dimension it. You can annotate it, move it forward uh, by modeling uh, directly. Uh, from what uh, you get inside of Revit uh, from, from the point cloud. And I'm sure you've all seen this uh, or something similar to it uh, in the past. Let's give it a couple of seconds uh, to appear at least. And there we go. So, and you can snap to that and start modeling it forward. So that's quite an interesting use of, of our recap technology, and we're beginning to move that forward as well with other uh, versions of that uh, coming to market soon. Um, let me just kill this, if I can, in terms of the volume. Uh, oh, here we go. Got it. Whoops. What'd I do, yeah. Kevin? I don't know. <laughs> What'd you do? Let's just go back. Maybe. I need to kill the volume. It was off. There we go. Done. I think we need to kill that one in there. And just replay this. Here we go. So go in here. There we go. So 
The other thing we're starting to see, apologies for that, is um, a lot more use of computational design, and uh, Alain spoke wonderfully to, to that technology and how um, specifically, I think the, the consultants, the design engineers, are beginning to sort of embrace that. We introduced Dynamo, um, you know, a little while ago, a couple of years ago, and it's surprising, particularly in the MEP space, how quickly that's been adopted. Um, and it's being adopted to solve design engineering solutions. So where we had customers saying to us, "Look, you need to, you know, you need to solve these solutions for us to be able to sort of support regional calculations or standards," now they're starting to find solutions for themselves. Um, and that's spilling over into other areas. This is an example from a company called Building SP, where they're basically automatically routing conduit, electrical conduit. And the idea is that it's some sort of a, a basic sort of machine learning uh, capabilities for being built into this, where it knows where you're going from and to. It can record that, and you can rerun these scenarios at later stages. And what it will do is automatically route your conduit through the building, avoiding all clashes. So you guys, you know, you're going to be out of work because of something like this, or not, as the case may be, because <laughs> we all know that's uh, never actually going to quite happen. It's interesting use of that particular type of technology as we start to see sort of rules-based design, deep learning, machine learning creeping into, into the industry. The other thing we've seen over the course of the last sort of 12 months is a lot more manufacturers starting to approach us, but also starting to get a lot more proactive about creating content. Um, one of those, and I think probably the poster child for the industry as far as uh, I'm concerned, is Victolic. Um, Autodesk and Victolic have entered into a partnership, and so you'll be seeing some stuff coming to market from both of us, certainly in terms of sort of um, materials around you know, the, the readiness of Revit, uh, and of course the, uh, the, the Revit um, plug-in from, from Victolic which is really helping to drive a lot of success of Revit, particularly in North America. We talked to a lot of customers who are using that to plug some of the gaps that uh, still exist in our solution. And I'll be talking a little bit about that as we go through. But uh, I think this is a good example of where um, manufacturers have gone beyond just delivering content. And they're now looking at delivering tools that make it easier for you to use Revit. But of course, you know, select uh, and procure uh, their content as well. Um, so we're very pleased to be uh, in partnership with Victolic. The other thing we're starting to see uh, quite a lot of, and it's been mentioned over the last couple of days as well, is you know, the introduction of VR, AI, and that kind of thing. Um, this is an example from a company uh, that has offices in both Germany and Russia. And they've been using the Revit model to actually maintain the facility. And this is one of the few examples that I've actually seen of, of this in practice. There's been a lot of kind of research style projects that have been put together and put out there. But this is a real world example. Um, and basically, as you can see from this video, uh, which isn't the best quality, so I apologize. Um, they basically you know, start off by drilling into the model, identifying where in the building they need to go to address a particular issue. Um, and then once they've, they've explored that and they understand it at, at, at a high level, they can then go off to that particular part of the building uh, and start to explore it. Uh, this is quite a long video, so let me see if I can, without completely breaking the technology, move it along somewhat. Would appear not. <laughs> um, but basically, what you do is you, in, you enter into the room. Above the door is a is a barcode or QR code, and that will instantly access that part of the model for you. Uh, and you can then start investigating the services that are inside the uh, in the ceiling void. What's particularly interesting about this, I guess, is the fact that um, it has the capability to go a lot further if you start introducing GPS technology, which is obviously the next sort of step to that, and it knows where you are in the building. Um, but beyond that. I think the fact that you can investigate what services are in the, in the ceiling with, with some degree of confidence without having to stick your head above that dusty, dark um, ceiling tile and try and figure out which pipe is running where and you know, which tape says flow and return and all that kind of thing, and then try and solve the problem. So this is a very real world example of uh, how that kind of technology is, is really being used. Is anybody doing anything like this, exploring this kind of stuff? You, that hand? Yeah? Fantastic. Um, so this is really interesting, and I think we're going to see a lot more of this kind of thing. Um, you know, if you, if you take a look at sort of HoloLens, um, we've just recently re uh, launched a product called um, Autodesk Live, previously called Stingray on, uh, on Beta, where you can basically take a Revit model and push it out to HoloLens. I think you know, that's going to really sort of try to accelerate some of the adoption of uh, technology like this in that, in that space. 
Okay. Um, the other thing we're seeing is, is manufacturers approaching uh, BIM um, from a slightly different sort of angle. Those that maybe haven't necessarily been in this space before, uh, suddenly realizing that there's a connection between IoT and BIM, okay, which may seem obvious to us, but it hasn't necessarily been to some of these larger manufacturers in the past. The penny's beginning to drop. This is an interesting one. It's a, a screenshot from Cisco's digital ceilings, if, if anybody's uh, seen this one. Um, there's two things I find particularly interesting about it. First of all, they've, um, they've got this wonderful technology where as you walk into the space, it knows who you are and what your preferences are. You know, it can do things like uh, adjust the shades uh, on the windows and it can turn the lights on that you want or control the temperature. And the digital setting thing is specifically about things like temperature and lighting and that kind of thing. Um, but this is Cisco and this is the, the networking company, right? This isn't uh, a Schneider Electric or all the other electrical companies that we see out there that we usually associate with this type of technology. It's a data company. And they're basically saying, look, you know, we're about data. We want to know about these buildings as well as these individuals in those buildings. And so they're beginning to disrupt this space. So it's, it's quite interesting how we're seeing new players coming into this uh, particular industry. The other thing we've seen, not surprisingly, is an increasing number of BIM mandates. This hasn't slowed. This is just some of them that are uh, currently active around the world. They're not all government mandates. Many of them are industry, owner operator, particularly this middle sector here, uh, uh, mandates. What is encouraging, though, if you look at the top left-hand corner there, European BIM Task Force, what's basically happened is that you've seen a group of European countries like Germany, the UK, et cetera, come together and start to consolidate their efforts, start to share what they've got, which means they can accelerate, obviously, their efforts around this. Um, and it's good news because, surprisingly, Germany have been a little bit further behind, say, the UK or particularly the Nordics. Um, and they can start to share their knowledge and uh, you know, move things along much quicker. So that's happened in the last 12, 18 months. And that's very encouraging, I think. Um, the other thing we've seen in the UK is the launch of uh, our own BIM mandate, which happened in April this year. Uh, this is from this year's 2016 NBS report on sort of where we are as the UK in terms of uh, BIM uh, adoption. I'm not going to read all these out, but you can see, you know, generally speaking, uh, we're driving adoption, and I think, you know, we, we, as Autodesk would say that as well. And it's the usual thing, you know, it's driving down project costs, it's better deliverables, better communications, all the sorts of things that you've, you've heard over the last couple of days. But some impressive numbers. Um, I think the challenge we've got at the moment as the UK is to sort of now push this out to the industry as a whole. This is very, pri uh, very sort of public sector focused. It needs to be pushed out to the wider industry, but I'm, I'm confident we'll get there. And the other thing that we continue to see is that contractors are moving to BIM faster than, than any other uh, sector within the industry. Um, and that's backed up by these numbers from late last year from McGraw-Hill and Dodge uh, Data and Analytics, where, as you can see, you know, contractors are moving to BIM because they, uh, they see real value, not because they're being pushed by their peers. And so you know, those are the kinds of things that are really driving some of the things that we're doing and our strategy around what we do with Revit as a platform. Um, and as I said last year, you know, we've started, we started originally with uh, Revit focusing very much on the design engineer. We've started to include detailing capabilities now post MAP acquisition. And of course, we've got our BIM 360 portfolio. So the, the, the goal really is to have a single model authoring platform and the ability to go from design here all the way through and, and to move through each phase without having to remodel and throw things away. We, we talked a bit about that. So where are we with that? Uh, well, we've hooked up the database to Revit, and we've tried to blur these lines a little bit but keep them inside of Revit. Um, and that really is supportive of our sort of broader strategy. So you know, if we look across the, the project lifecycle, you know, we start a concept design with our tools like Insight 360, um, very much focused at the architect, the building physics engineer, and the design engineer, and then into Revit and downstream through EST to CAM to the BIM 360 portfolio. And this all linking ultimately into our sort of cloud platform. So those of you that uh, have been following what we're doing around our developer network would have heard the term Forge. Um, and Forge is kind of the new name really for ADN. And the, and the goal is to sort of have all this plugged into that Forge platform, which is a cloud-based offering, 
And then that, in turn, through a series of services, will enable players to come along and start hooking into these products. So, for example, for ERP, you, know, you could have an SAP um, who you know, wouldn't typically have uh, been engaged in this space, but you're working with. You know, they can very easily come in and connect to, to our products and our platforms through the Forge uh, framework. Um, so we just provide services for those players. And so we can start to plug in a number of different things, such as you know, design partner analysis apps and uh, field construction layout apps and you know, linking MIS partners. So that's really been the strategy in terms of you know, building out uh, the Revit platform. So in 2017, we introduced the ability to be able to take this generic engineering model using generic families, highlight the entire run, select the service that you want to convert it to, and then you can convert automatically, as you see here in green, to a uh, particular service from the external database, which is the fabrication database. So for those of you using Academy P, S, and CAM, you know, that database that you've invested in, uh, you can reuse here. Uh, and so this became a lot more capable with the 2017 release. We, we did begin with 2016 with the part pipe bar offering. Um, and so what we've done is really just to, to extend that by enabling you to take the engineer's generic model and just convert that at the pick of a button. Of course, it's never quite that easy. It's never a one-to-one -one mapping. And so then you have to go through and basically start value engineering that model, right? So there are certain things that won't necessarily convert. There are other things that will. Um, and uh, you, you're then highlighted to those areas that uh, you need to go and pay particular attention to. Um, the other thing we did was we introduced some more productivity tools. So this is uh, Root and Fill. Um, and this feature basically allows you to connect, as you can see here, from the end of one item to the other. And it will basically route the service for you. And then over on the right-hand side here, it's going to give you the capability to, to select which items you want included in that routing and which ones you don't. So one of the things we haven't yet got to is this kind of point-click, auto-fill uh, layout, which you're all very familiar with in Revit. And that's something that's on the, uh, is, is on the list to be addressed. And you'll see that in, in a not-too-distant future. But in the interim, you have this point uh, sort of root and fill selection tool uh, that kind of, kind of helps you get there to, to some extent. Um, this is also you know, the introduction of some basic rules-based layout, rules-based design. You, know, you can build up the rules um, you know, in terms of how, what, what combinations of fittings you want in that uh, and other such information inside the service, and it will respect those as it starts to lay out uh, this pipe, duct, or containment services. We've also done quite a lot of work, and you're going to see a media release of Revit coming uh, in the next couple of months, and you'll see additional work in this area around improving the sort of layout tools for, uh, for fabrication detailing. So, you know, we've been criticized a little bit at times for it not sort of being very Revit-like. Uh, there's been some sort of, you know, clunkiness, I would say, to sort of uh, the approach we've taken. And what we're doing is starting to smooth that over and making it a lot more easy to, to model Revit light with the fabrication parts um, inside of Revit. And you can see here, we've introduced some really nice coordination layout um, tools which allow you to do things that you, you couldn't previously do and so in some cases still can't do with Revit families. Um, and there's been a lot of talk about you know, why ITMs and, and, what, and, and not Revit families. And you know, simply because you can't do some of these things with Revit families. They were never designed to do that. They're design uh, elements. Uh, designed to be generic. And so you can do things now like this where you can drag the, at the end of one component and snap it to another and it will respect the rules of those uh, components in terms of manufacturing. Um, so you can have some you know, confidence in, in sort of pushing and pulling the model about knowing that it's still real world. It's not sort of just some crazy fitting that uh, you know, we've managed to fit between two, two uh, other elements. Um, and the, the nice thing about this is that because we're using the fabrication model, we, you can now literally take the, um, the Revit model and open that up inside of SMEP and instantly get your pricing as well as your labor. And if you've gone to the uh, extent that we saw from Tim and you're going to hear from, uh, from Kevin shortly, um, then this is you know, very valuable information that you can get access to instantly uh, from the Revit model. Okay. 
Um, and it's simply a, you know, a click of a button. Uh, there's no import, export, there's no exchange. And we fully support the MAJ file format inside of uh, Revit. Uh, so it, it literally is like a native RFA file or you know, Revit file, Revit project file. Um, and then hangers too, we've enhanced hangers with the release. Uh, to, you know, diff there's a couple of different options there, uh, including the ability to extend hangers more easily, um, trapeze them to add them one to another, uh, you know, stack them and, and so on and so forth. And this is an area where I've seen a lot of uh, Dynamo being used. We've got some of our customers writing scripts to auto lay out hangers and, and automate the, the positioning of them. Uh, and of course, we have improved reporting capabilities uh, with this as well, uh, thanks to some of the feature sets that come with the fabrication products. Uh, we can <coughs> quickly take the Revit model and produce an ancillary lists uh, from that uh, for things like hangers. And then finally, that same Revit model is, you know, now can be easily pushed out to CAM, whereupon you can perform your cut sheet nesting, cut sheet op optimization, and go straight to the machines. So, you know, we've still got a little bit of work to do, it's fair to say, in, in sort of, you know, completing the feature. We're working on a number of services um, that are going to help build out some of the missing capabilities, um, such as spool diagramming. But it's going to be a while before we see those, and in the interim, we've got partners like um, Victolic that are providing some really nice tools to fill those gaps. Um, so it really is, uh, we believe, got to a point where you know, it's ready to be used from design to detailing, uh, and it really is ready for fabrication. Um, so that's a little bit of an update on where we are. Uh, as I say, there's a new release coming in just a couple of months. Um, and it's all very well us standing here saying this is all wonderful and this is what we've done, but uh, the proof is really in the pudding. So with that being said, let me uh, hand over to Kevin, who's going to talk to you a little bit about what Comfort Systems are doing with uh, our MEP tools. Thank you, Steve. It's all yours. Okay. <coughs> Let's get another PowerPoint going here. See if it's going to start. There we go. Okay. Um, so first off, I want to say thanks to AMCA, um, Shannon, Summit, all the, the, the invitees, I guess, that, that brought me here. Um, and um, again, uh, to reiterate what Tim said earlier, is, is he still here or no? Oh, Tim's here or not. Um, yeah, he's gone. Um, what a great place, right? This is my, actually my second time to Sydney. Um, I was here about 10 years ago. Um, and matter of fact, I renewed my passport to come back here because it expires every 10 years. So, um, so we're going to talk about um, what, what are we doing with it at Comfort, right? So, so we just saw we just saw what Steve showed: the ability to use fab parts in Revit, um, all the route and field tools. Um, there, there's some additional tools in there that he didn't get to. That's okay. Um, that I guess the point being is we're going to show some examples and, and back up a little bit and say, how, how, do we, how do we use fab parts in Revit and what's required to get there, right? Um, so I'm more the technology uh, guy, okay? I came from the field, okay? But um, somehow landed in this position of um, implementation, if you will, and training, okay? So, uh, we're going to talk about a central utility plant and a pipe rack here in a bit, but uh, as always, let's talk about who we are so you understand my challenges. Um, 1.6 billion year revenue, 7,000 employees for Comfort Systems. Um, 36 different operating companies, but I specifically, me and my team, don't work with all of them because some of those are service groups, right? So they're not doing... Um, full 3D coordination. They're doing a lot of rich, small retrofit work, things like that. So they're they're not in this they're not in this sector, right? At, at least at this point in time. Okay. So here here's our locations. <laughs> Every week I'm usually at one of those dots. Not all of them, but I travel on a weekly basis, and I'm I'm at one of those locations sometime throughout the year. Uh, me and two other guys, and we're doing follow-up visits, additional training, whatever it may be uh, on the agenda for that particular 
uh, we call them operating companies because they're a company within a larger company, right? Okay. So, um, just like you, every building you see is what we do, right? Some way, some shape, some form, that building has to be built, it has to be maintained. We're in that sector, we're in that market, okay? Um, so, who's the team? Here we are, oh, I got a, didn't fix my slide. Oh well, <laughs> poor guy. Um, so I started here first, May of 2013. September, July, so we put this team together fairly quickly when I got here and realized, uh-oh, we got a problem, okay? And the problem I noticed was that, if, if I can back up a few slides here, most of those dots who were using the fabrication database, each one of them had, a, had their own database, okay? And so my challenge was, first off they brought me on and said, well we want you to go train all these people how to use it better. And I said, well hold on a minute. I can't train each one of these guys how to do it better if we're not all doing the same thing. <laughs> okay? Not, not too far off from what you're trying to do here with BMA, right? Except for I'm doing it with one organization, a lot of different companies, you're trying to do it for a lot of different companies, but still establish the same standards, right? So, very, very similar um, uh, in, in that nature. So, William Tucker came on. Um, some of you may recognize some of these guys. Um, it, I, I'm here, I, I admit, I used to work for TSI. Any of you who know that company? I used to work for those guys, okay? I worked for them for six years. Uh, so did these other two guys. So, I was a trainer, they were trainers, uh, Josh was specific to the estimating side of training, me and William were on CAD and CAM, okay? So, it's fortunate for comfort that we all three are now here because we can do virtually everything comfort needs to do, okay? Um, we do CAD implementation, estimate implementation, we do hook up a plasma tables, tr uh, trimble training, uh, productivity enhancements, whatever it may be. This is our, that all falls under our role, right? <laughs> For comfort systems. So here, here they are. Um, build a single database that can be shared between multiple locations, be able to update it and make it scalable, right? Kind of sounds like BMA. <laughs> Okay? It's exactly what you guys are doing, right? It's exactly what you're doing, okay? So, uh, just flip through some of these. Um, uh, how many of the guys from A2K are here? Are, are they here? Yeah, there's one guy back there in the back, okay? That, that kind of matches your list, doesn't it? Almost, almost identically, right? Okay? Now, here, here's where it gets interesting because now, we're gonna drive multiple plasma tables with one database, right? What are you trying to do? Same thing, okay? What needs to be done? Connectors, seams, notches, right? We get into the database, now we have to have all these things matching in order for that to work, right? Some of you are shaking your head like, yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about, right? <laughs> okay, so um, material pricing, labor, right? Um, if we don't have all of that data in there, and the presentation that Tim showed this morning where he's able to run reports and be able to forecast and know percent completes on jobs, if that data is not there, we're not doing any good, right? Okay? So we're responsible for doing all of that, okay? Um, this, this one right here, write lisps, lisp and script routines. I'm not a programmer by trade, I'm a field guy. <laughs> But I've learned how to write a little bit of Lisp, and Mr. Tucker, the, the guy in the middle there on the, on the slide previous, um, he took on scripting. And so between the two of us, we have been able to do what Comfort needed to do in order to facilitate 
changing lots of connectors, seams, notches, sealant, all of these things that happen because I'm company A and I'm in Greensboro, North Carolina, and I'm company B and I'm in Fort Worth, Texas, I want to use a standard database, a single database, that I want to build generic pressure classes for. So how many of you in here have sat down and built a pressure class? Yeah, a few of you? Okay, yeah, you know what I'm talking about, right? So if I put in sealant in a pressure class, and then I download that and start running reports on it, whatever sealant's in there, that's the sealant I'm getting, right? Okay? Well, guess what? A script can change that on the fly, right? So now we have lots of tools that run behind the scenes because now I have a single database. We're distributing between 23 companies or something, I think it is, I lose count. And through scripting, I can change that sealant because they're using sealant A versus sealant B. Doesn't matter to me, I got a generic pressure class that we run and now we run the script on it and we're done, okay? Right at the time we download to the plasma table, okay? So, um, in the production side, right? Productivity and fabrication enhancements. This was a big one. Somebody touched on this the other day about being able to utilize an employee from somebody else's company here in Australia because we were using BMA and we could share resources, right? We're doing the exact same thing, only internal to our company and I can have somebody on the East Coast help somebody on the West Coast and it doesn't matter to me. It's the same database, it's the same setup, design line works the same. Route, or not route and fill, route and fill's a rapid thing. Um, Multi-point fill, right? So uh, all of that functionality all works the same. Prefabrication. W when we started this process, we, re we didn't really understand um, the, the additional benefits it was going to bring to the table, right? We kind of knew some of them, but um, w when we talk about prefabrication, I can draw it in Washington, D.C. and have a company in Harrisonburg, Virginia build it for me. Why? Single database, right? BMA. Again, I can't, uh, I can't stress enough the, 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 the relationship here between what we have done and what you're in the process of doing and, and continuing to do and build, right? Um, uh, Trimble training, we mentioned that. Um, sheet metal, mechanical piping, plumbing shop setup, right? Um, so one of the things, one of the things that we have here at Comfort is a very diverse group of companies, okay? We have the, the super achiever, okay? The, the two to three hundred million dollar a year company that, that is just on top of it, that's, that's doing very well. And I still have the companies who come to me saying, well, we're, we're reading this contract and it says something about BIM. Can you help me understand what that is? Okay. Well, first off, don't sign the contract because if you don't know what it is, <laughs> <don't>, <laughs> you certainly probably can't uh, fulfill the contract, right? Let's talk about it and let's see what it is. So then we engage and figure out what's going on there. Okay. Um, so we have a very diverse per portfolio of companies within Comfort, okay? Um, so let's talk, about, let's talk about where we're at. Um, as far as parts and pieces, right? Um, over 20,000 items in our current database, okay? And because we're in such a diverse market, it takes a lot of content to make that happen, okay? If I was dealing with just a, a, a contractor in, in Fort Worth, Texas, and they do commercial work, I would only need some uh, uh, welded, some carbon steel, maybe some ProPress, some, some cast iron, some no-hub, you know, maybe a few other things, and I'm good to go, right? But, remember the diversity, well, every operating company in their jurisdiction, in their area of the country, they use a different valve. So guess what? We gotta have more valves in here, okay? So it just keeps growing and growing, okay? I don't see this, it, it slowed down for us, but I don't see it ever stopping, okay? We don't build our own content, okay? 
There's no way we could do what we do, the three of us, and sit around and build content, okay? That's a choice we made. Um, we chose to go with building data, okay? Some of you probably have heard of that, know what that is, okay? Um, so when we need content, we go to a website and we download it, okay? Included in that is material pricing and labor, right? And the map prod. Who, who in here is working with map prod, any at all? Anybody worked with that? Anybody even know what map prod is? Okay, yeah, one guy here does, okay? So, when I talk about 257,000 line items of map prod, okay? If I was to take my database and dump it to Excel, that is how many line items of, of different material we have in our database. Eh, small. No, not really, okay? It's a huge undertaking, right? And the guy that was on the far right over here earlier, Josh, that's his forte, okay? So that 257,000 line items includes, let's take a weld bin elbow, okay? And it's available from two to 20 inch. I know it's more than that, but whatever the size ranges is, right? Each one of those is a line item in map prod. So that 20,000 items turns into 257,000 lines of data that has to be maintained and updated for pricing and labor, specifically, okay? There's no way, again, I'm not gonna sit around and build that. We got better things to do, okay? So, whoop, let's go to here. There we go, okay. So, we have this national database, right, for us, nationwide, and the different software packages that it takes to run that. And I think what's important here is all the things that we just saw for fabrication parts in Revit, in order for that to work, you have to have a fabrication database set up, right? It doesn't work without it. You, we need to be able to bring in that fabrication database in order for fab parts in Revit to work. So we've done the behind the scenes work here for this to get started. So currently, 131 users of Academy P, okay? We have 17 Camduct users. That's inclusive of nine coil lines and 14 plasma tables. So we have the ability to send sheet metal wherever we need to to have it fabricated across the United States, okay? Just that piece right there, is a pretty big undertaking, <laughs> okay? So, um, when we get down to remote entry, uh, you know, a little bit smaller users, this side right here, the estimating side, um, I suspect that that number by this time next year will probably be at least twice and probably maybe three or four times as large, okay? Um, because, are, when, when, when we got here and realized all the different databases and all the different things that we needed to go solve, we said, okay, let's start with the biggest ROI that, that we know as a MEP contractor, which is Academy P. Let's start here first, here and CAM, okay? Those were our two focuses when we first got here, okay? Keep in mind, this has only been two and a half years, okay? <laughs> it's two and a half years that were to these numbers. But we focused on CAD and CAM because that was the staple, right? That's what we knew when we got that functioning. All of these other pieces here would fall into play, okay? They're just gonna, it, they're, it, it's just gonna, by nature, it, it's just going to happen, okay? And, and, and we're seeing that now because of the work we did to build the database and to get the CAD and the CAM going and up on board and running, okay? So, we, we had, we, it wasn't without struggles, right? <laughs> Was not without struggles. Um, we, we had several instances where we would try to go do a CAM install and we couldn't get it to download properly 
and we're on the phone um, with some of our support guys, some of our other colleagues, and oh yeah, we need to try this, we need to try that. Um, William, William has taken that leg on uh, himself, and he's, he's taken that role and, and really ran with it, and it's, it's incredible what he's done with that. Um, so, um, but let, let's go to where we're at, okay? So inside of that database, okay? So if you've ever sat down and built a fabrication database, you know that just building the database alone can be quite time consuming, okay? Now, we have to decide how we're gonna distribute it, how we're gonna maintain it, okay? Those were our two next two challenges, so I'll kind of divert off of this just a little bit. Building it for us wasn't the problem because we knew how to do that. What we didn't know was how are we going to distribute it and make it scalable and updatable for 23 companies and still have everybody have admin rights, okay? They had to be able to log in and make their changes and do things, okay? And at the same time, we didn't want them messing with the original setup, right? So profiles came into play, okay? So if anybody, if you ever tried profiles, when profiles first came out with fabrication software, they didn't work very well, okay? Nowadays, we could not live without them, okay? We use profiles exclusively to make this function, okay? And so the second dilemma was how do we distribute it, okay? We've got companies, you saw the red dots, right? All over the United States. How do we distribute this national database, keep everybody up to speed on all the latest changes that we're doing, and every time they build a profile, they get the most updated information, okay? That's how that works. So we tested lots of different things. You know what we ended up with? Dropbox, okay? Believe it or not. We put, a, we put this in Dropbox, and we run it from Dropbox. And we're looking at some other solutions because there's some security issues that, that we're concerned about with Dropbox. They're trying to address those, but we're looking at some other things. Um, not to say we're switching, but for, for over two years, we've been running it on Dropbox, okay? Flawlessly, I'll tell you that, okay? We had, we had a... Uh, what do they call them, the robo-viruses or one of the um, ransom viruses. There we go. We had a ransom virus hit, okay? One guy's machine in Harrisonburg, Virginia, it got into his Dropbox. We were able to ca call Dropbox, restore that event that had occurred over the weekend, and we had the company up, back up and running in less than four hours. The same type of scenario happened at another company it took them almost a week to get their drafting department back up to speed because they had everything on their server in their office, okay? Just a little side note of what happened to us and, and where we're at, okay? So we solved the problem of distribution and we solved the problem of um, get, getting access to the database and maintaining the database, okay? Now we had to build services. So we got 122 sheet metal services in our database, okay? In our global database, I'll say, okay? I've got 214 mechanical piping and plumbing services, okay? So these are services that when, when that operating company starts, they get to pick from, okay? So let's say on a particular project, they only need chill water and heating water on that project. So when they create that profile, they go right through, they pick out of that, they pick that that chill water needs to be welded by, by ProPress Copper, and it needs to be chill water and heating water. So they pick those four services, create their profile. When they fire it up, all they see is four services. They're done, okay? Phenomenal, okay? So they have the ability, though, to go back and update. That's eh, not real easy, but they can go back and update, make some more services, do whatever they need to do. 240 sheet metal specifications, okay, to, to serve 23 companies. I can tell you, we sat down and did some math on this. If we had to build a, spe a specification or a pressure class for each region of the country, for each type of sealant, for each type of 
damper, and on and on and on, all the things that go into a pressure class, we were in the hundreds of thousands of pressure classes, okay? It wasn't feasible, we couldn't do it. So what did we do? We came up with a way for scripting, I alluded to earlier, to change those out on the fly when I sent that MAJ to this table, that table, or that table. Okay? And so now, I limit the number of specifications that I need to build into my global database that I can share amongst 23 companies to only 240. And, and that grows a little bit only because we get some new material, right? It, I can't do anything about a new material. When I get a new material, I have to build a new spec. Okay, there's really no other way around it, okay? Look at that, 10 sheet metal templates. That's all I need, okay? Mechanical piping and plumbing templates, right? So these are services, these are the templates that go along with them, right? Everybody understand, well, most people understand, if you're in the fabrication database, you know exactly what I'm talking about, right? And 85 processes, okay? <laughs> Quite alarming, but it works, okay? Because company A needs to have just on the CAM side alone three to four processes, okay? So that's where the 85 comes in, 20 companies, three to four processes, there's your 85 processes right there, okay? So when they run their process at their company, it looks at their table, nest metal on their table because this company might have a 10 by 20 sheet and this guy's using five by 10 metal, whatever it may be, different size tables. Each process drives what happens to the plasma table and what size uh, metal that the nest gets put on for the shop, okay? Absolutely phenomenal, okay? So, um, but if it wasn't for profiles, none of this could occur. But now that we have this done, now we can load inside of Revit, we can load the configuration and then the particular profile that's been modified to suit the needs of that job or that company, okay? Because for instance, if I built a, a mechanical piping template here and I've got a manufacturer A valve on there, let's call it Milwaukee, right? But the job specs say, nope, we're using Nibco valves. Well, when the, when the profile's created, company A needs to go switch out that Milwaukee valve and put a Nibco valve in there. He's doing that in his profile. It does not affect the global database, okay? Now, when he loads that into Revit, he's using the proper valve in Revit as well, okay? It's huge, okay? So we still have to maintain this. We still need this foundation for the next step, okay? So, just some parts and pieces, some of the things we're doing, data exports, right? So we need to get this data out to Excel. Um, this is just a sample of one of our exports that we're doing here, um, bringing in all the rod, total linear footage of rod. Um, you know, this goes out to PM superintendents, hey, you need to order this here. Here's an Excel spreadsheet, start ordering it, right? Um, some of the, you know, again, just the data that's behind the scenes, right? Getting the, the reports out, how many, whoops, sorry, uh, how many pieces, you know, 21 footers, what size, you know, all that good stuff. Um, fab times, install times, total cost for rectangular duct versus round duct versus piping, you know. Um, again, just, you know, the, the capabilities of the fabrication database, right? I'm not showing you anything new. Um, but if you don't have it set up, yeah, it's gonna take a little while, right? Um, so the other thing that we do is prefabrication of hangers and, but in order to do that, we need to know dimensional data, so we built us a little logo or a icon, put it on here, and now based on the 
values, we can prefabricate that hanger and the detailer just runs a report and we're done, right? So um, pretty straightforward uh, data here. Terminal numbers, uh, this is a linear, this is a square footage report, okay? So this was, this was interesting. I'm sitting in a company and it happened to be in Harrisonburg, Virginia, and we're in a meeting and then the guy says, well, I gotta leave because we're getting ready to do a duct test and I've gotta go calculate up manually all the square footage of, of this run of ductwork so that we can figure out how much uh, loss of, of air we could have in this particular run of duct. And I'm like, wait a minute, what do you mean you're gonna go calculate it up manually? <laughs> I said, all we need to do is build your report we can tell you the linear footage of that, how much square footage it is, the volume of that. We got all this data. And so the next day, we, we went home that night, we built the report, the next day we showed it to him. He's like, this just saved me about six hours of work on that one little project. We built a report, right? It, 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 was, it was crazy. I'm thinking, what, why didn't we already have this done? So, and then again, you know, another sample you know, build a little logo, put it on the report. Now I know where all the data comes from for prefabrication of, of hangers, uh, job information. So where are we at now, right? So, so this was the history of uh, ha, ha, when, when I got here and, and what needed to be done. But where are we at now and, and what does all this mean, right? We're, we're, what can we do? So. We're converting design models right now in Revit. That's a much faster workflow. Who's, who's used process run before? Yeah? 20, yeah, a few people back here, okay. So you remember, so highlight the stuff, store design line elements, store graphical elements, take it all out, process run, right? All goes away now, right? You select the run, you saw, you saw um, Steve, just show it. You select the run and design the fabrication button and you convert it right there inside of Revit, right? So um, we're not there yet, but intentions are fully coordinate, create assemblies in Revit. We still don't have all of the parameters and all of the data to run the reports just like I was showing you all ago. I don't have all that in Revit yet, okay? So there's going to be a line we have to draw in the sand at some point to say, okay, I'm done with coordination, I'm done with spooling, now I'm ready to go to fabrication, okay? So we, we, we don't know what that line is yet. We're still working on that right now, okay? And, that, and that's what this is, reports, bill of materials, linear nest reports, uh, all of that right now is still a function of Academy P, okay? I'm okay with that because we know what the roadblock is, right? I'm not going into the unknown. I know exactly what I need to do here and I know exactly what I can get done in Revit. And I just have to be able to find that break and say, okay, here we go. Create the MAJ file. Let's take it to fabrication and let's run the reports and do the things we need to do, okay? So, um, Design to fabrication, we, we, we've got currently two projects going that are doing that internally, okay? Um, I'll be the first to say, I've been a CAD guy all my life, okay? Learning Revit, I'm quite impressed so far, okay? Um, we have already gone out and we've done some work on our own to do some work with assemblies in Revit um, we've got a rev one of that. Uh, we're working on revision two. And once we finish that little tool right there, I do believe that I'm gonna be able to create spools faster in Revit than I can in fabrication, hands down, okay? So, that was, that was one of our hurdles, okay? The other hurdle and I'm new to Revit, and, and for those of you who have been using Revit and understand Revit, when, when you create views, now you gotta put those, create, you gotta add sheets, you gotta take those views, put them on sheets, and you gotta apply view templates to those sheets, and then you gotta go in and edit all the data for the sheets, 
and call it the name and this and that and the other, right? Anybody in here use Dynamo yet? Nobody? Yeah, couple? Okay. So I'm learning Dynamo as well currently, okay? And I've figured out a way to take that process that I just described and automate it with Dynamo, okay? And it has the ability to go read Excel. So now I can um, define all of my uh, sheet names in Excel, mechanical piping, level one, A, B, C, D, E, whatever, however I'm gonna name all of my sheets, and I can have Dynamo read that, go to Revit and create them all for me, and then, oh, by the way, I wanna put those views on those sheets as well. I can't do that in AutoCAD, right? <laughs> <laughs> no way, not gonna happen, right? So there's a lot to be said so far in, in, in the short term that I've been in the Revit environment for what it can do for us as an MEP contractor, okay? And again, I, I, I'm here to tell you I'm green at it, okay? I am just learning, okay? So um, there's probably a lot of you in this room that are way further ahead in that arena than I am, okay? So, um, is it working? There we go. Um, so, just as examples, some of the things, obviously, that, that, that we're doing with, with our different companies, um, prefabrication of hangers, putting them on racks. Um, one, one of the things that we've started doing here that's not on this uh, piece is each hanger now gets a label on it and it has a QR code associated with it. So when that hanger's fabricated and it's going out the shop or getting put on the cart, we're scanning it with a little scanner. And so now we know, just like Tim was showing earlier, that he's, he's going into the, to the live model and updating the status of that particular run of pipe or run of duct or whatever it may be we're using QR codes to update these to say they've been fabricated, okay? And we know they were on cart 25, and we scanned them on the 12th of March, and then we can scan the cart because we put QR codes on the little carts here. We can scan that, and we know what day that left the shop going to the job site. Our next adventure, I'll put it that way, <laughs> Our next adventure is to now start utilizing scanning uh, what we can. We, we, we don't know the processes yet, but what can we do for the field site, right? We're, we're exploring some things. Uh, that's the hurdle. You see, I mean, Tim's in the same boat, okay? He's changing things manually right now because that, that's the best way you can do it right now, okay? Um, so we're using QR codes. We're doing that on all our cast iron, um, copper, all of those parts and pieces. So. Um, again, modular, you know, modular pieces, skids, right? So no, nothing new. Uh, a success story and a failure all at the same time, okay? This particular project was a school project. There were 70 or 80 classrooms that were identical to that right there, okay? Sounds pretty simple, right? We stack the pieces of duck, we put them on some little uh, piano dollies, we turn the, the taps inside out, put all the flex, the elbows, the spirals inside, wheel that into the classroom and we put it in, right? Sounds pretty simple. So we started building these, putting them in trucks, shipping them about two and a half hours. We didn't realize the message, here we go back to communication, the message didn't get all the way to the installers in the field. So when they got to the field, the rooms weren't ready. They wheeled these over to a holding area, took them off the dollies because they thought the dollies needed to go back to bring another shipment and left all the ductwork sitting on the floor. <laughs> so now what do you have? You got, a, you got an absolute mess on your hands because now I can't take one person and push that down the corridor and put it into the room it needs to go in. I need at least two people, if we can even pick that up, and probably not. Now I gotta disassemble it and get it to the room, okay? 
So all the planning that we had done to get to that point, beautiful model, beautiful prefabrication, everything that we did, but the message wasn't delivered all the way to the end, right? I, success and failure. This was, this was absolutely brilliant. Worked perfectly. Okay? My, I mean, I'm not here to tell you we're perfect, right? <laughs> Um, so, um, I'm going to highlight w one particular company. I told you we had the, um, the, the huge portfolio here of companies, right? This happens to be a company that excels, okay? And I'm going to show you some examples of that, okay? Um, so, they 100% do um, everything they can as off-site construction, okay? Um, you can you know what it is manufacturing right offsite construction okay um, here's their manufacturing facility okay it's no small little place there right um, this happens to be a twenty thousand square foot mechanical room that's being built one hundred percent inside of the facility. We're going to take it apart. We're going to fly it in place and put it back together. Okay? So, in 2016, they're doing all the design in Revit, and they're drawing all of the ductwork and piping in Academy P. Okay? Then they're, in 2016, we could bring in an MAJ into Revit. So they were able to, through that process, build these central plants and do these things with a disconnected workflow, so to speak, right? We're doing all the, the piping and the ductwork over here. We have to bring that into Revit. They're trying to do all their coordination in Revit. So um, they, they have structural engineers on staff that, that design all of the modules and, and check for everything there. Um, so we were... We were working in two different platforms at that point in time, bringing them together and then going to production and, and building these pieces, right? Um, the two new projects that have just started, they're now doing everything they can with fabrication parts in Revit, okay? They're, they're trying to avoid, at this point in time, avoiding Cademy P and staying in Revit as much as possible, okay? So I opened up with a pipe rack. Well, it's no small pipe rack. 9.2 miles of pipe on this pipe rack, okay? 29 different piping systems. Um, Revit, Academy P, and Navisworks, okay? This pipe rack was right at a mile long, okay? So, logistically, how do you build that, okay? T Tim alluded to earlier that he had to get the design to change to facilitate his modules that he was gonna build with his um, uh, brewery, right? Anybody in here for that and saw that? And he had the highlighted little areas, okay? And so that's exactly what this turns out to be, okay? So obviously this is Revit. And this is another project where all the piping was done in Academy P and all of the structural detailing uh, design was done in Revit with, I believe, is it ISAT or, uh, I'm not a structural guy. So there was another program they used to do all the structural analysis before they brought it into Revit, okay? so. Um, I didn't think that was relevant here because we're really MEP guys. So, um, so this is just one piece of that rack, okay? So if you look right there, you can see where um, there's kind of double vertical, they're like a two by six uh, uh, tube steel. From that point to that point was a module and that module was built. So then you can see there's one from there to there, there would be one from there to there, one from there to there, 
So those are all separate modules that were prefabricated in the manufacturing facility, shipped out, and installed. Okay? Here was another problem. We did all of this coordination down to the eighth or sixteenth of an inch, all of this good stuff. But the guy putting in the footings wasn't on board. <laughs> Once again, lack of communication, right? It wasn't a showstopper. It hurt, yeah. We had to change some things and, and make some adjustments, but when you don't have everybody on board, it's crucial, right? So just showing the dimensional uh, parts and pieces, um, I believe that all of these were created as individual families, all of the risers, and they were able to be scheduled based on the location of it was, or the location of where it was at down the rack. So now we can prefabricate that uh, and based on a schedule, okay? So, um, and there's a sample of that, all the dimensional data, all the steel that needed to be going in that. Here's a picture of it in Navisworks. Um, again, a mile long pipe rack, right? So, a little bit, little bit of work there. Um, so here it is in the manufacturing facility, okay? Um, all of this, again, steel was built, taken out, hot dip galvanized, uh, brought back to the facility, put together, uh, all of the piping, U-bolts, uh, everything bolted down, ready to go, um, and then it goes out in um, uh, low boy trailers, right? 18 wheelers, and we start shipping, okay? So I believe there were 29 or 30 of those. No, there's more than that. Yeah. Um, so here's another one. Another example of what they've done to take advantage of um, off-site construction. So you can see here, 5,200-ton chiller plant, right? It's no small little, no small chiller plant, okay? Um, all of the data, 17 air handler units, um, project completed in a nine-month schedule, okay? So here, here's a sample of that, again, it's very evident when you look at this, you can see the split for the modules, okay? So all of those modules, again, fully assembled inside the manufacturing plant, fully tested, electrical, uh, water tested, everything done. It's interesting, they put, um, they put electrical boxes at, at each module split and uh, put quick connect couplers so that they can split the module, take it apart. When you get to the job site, it's plug and play, right? So um, again, the Revit workflow, this again, done with Academy P, brought into Revit, okay, in 2016, okay? So uh, a couple of elevation views there. And there's a finished product, okay? Quite impressive, you know. Uh, aluminum flooring, I mean, these, this is, this is quite, um, quite the build, okay? Um, so here, here they are, split, sitting in the shop, ready to be um, sent to the job site, okay? So um, here, here was a data center. Again, same processes, but we built the whole entire data, uh, data center inside the manufacturing facility and shipped it, okay? So, there's some pictures of that. There it is, complete. So it's got skin on it, it all comes with it, it's all there, ready to go. Two, two inch uh, insulation around the outside, doors, access panels, the whole nine yards, right? So it's all completed and done. I do believe, oh, I got one more. Oh, here, here was another one, yeah. Duke University, um, they had a 60 to 90 day window of construction 
two weekend shutdowns is what we took that to. Okay. Again, same same processes, right? Modular construction. Um, all of the planning done up front. We had to sit down with them, understand what they needed, um, the scope of the project. Uh, here's all the data. I, I'm not going to sit here and read it all to you, but um, the biggest one, the job required two 12-hour shifts comprised of 32 men per shift. And the owner thought it was going to be a 60 to 90 day construction process. Okay? And we did it in two weekends. A lot of guys there, don't get me wrong, but uh, two weekends. Okay? So there's that unit sitting there completed. That's the unit sitting on top of the roof. Okay? There it was in, in manufacturing. Flying it up. That's all I have. Okay? Any questions? I went through a lot of stuff there. Yep? In our market, absolutely. Um, you can see there, just changing the, um, the length of that construction cycle on site, right? Um, not to mention the liability issues that we reduce and safety, right? The list can go on and on of all the things that you reduce by doing it in a manufacturing type environment, closed building, easily monitored, right? Versus 100 men, women, whatever, out on a job site trying to do the exact same thing. So again, ju just like, just like um, Tim alluded to, it's engaging early with the design, right? We, it, if Duke, in that particular instance where we put that air handler in on top of the roof and we did it in two weekends, it, if Duke hadn't been approached, basically, and said, look, we can take your 90-day construction schedule and, and do it in two weekends, that probably would have never happened, right? Somebody else would have done that, and they would have done it in a, in a, um, a, a traditional construction process, and, and that's just how it would have been done, right? Yeah. So, so now it becomes marketing, right? Now, now, now you have to bring the thought, you have to bring the idea, and prove the process, and, and, and get the buy-in from the owner at the end of the day, okay? And, that, and that's what, again, that exemplary company, right? EAS, that's what they specialize in, and they do it very, very well. And, and that really shows like moving to the BIM space, the 3D modeling is even more important now that this process actually help us to, to you know, get to the next stage and reduce offsite fabrication. A a absolutely. So, so it just so happens that that offsite fabrication facility is in Greensboro, North Carolina, where, where, they, where the company resides. It doesn't have to be there, right? Yeah. It can be anywhere. If I can get that module on, a boat, a train, e anything I could put it on, I could build it and ship it, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and we know it's going to work when we get there. Mm -hmm. Because we've already installed it, we've already pre-assembled it, we've built it, we've tested it, we know it worked, and now all we have at, at, at the exterior is connection points, okay? Mm -hmm. An interesting side note, the, um, the building owners are liking this because in, in the Contractually in the United States, it doesn't, it doesn't apply to the square footage of the building. It's considered a piece of equipment. And they pay taxes on it differently because it's a self-sufficient, self-supporting module, if you will. Okay? So that, that, brings, up, that brings up a whole other issue. And I, believe me, I'm not in that arena. Okay? I'm not the financial guy, but it brings up a whole other, uh, call it a loophole, call it what you want, but... It doesn't qualify as part of the um, the building because it is a separate piece. Mm, it is yeah. a very exciting phase, actually, the way that the yes. things can be constructed that way. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thanks for that. Mm -hmm. What else?
Yeah. Say that again. Yeah, so, so be, in, in, in currently, because we have the national database, everything that they're doing is standardizing the fabrication of ductwork and piping and plumbing. But we don't have all companies doing what I showed you there, right? Believe me, <laughs> some of the other sister companies who have traveled to these facilities, they're trying to figure out now, well, how can we do this in our local market, right? So they're, they're, they're leveraging what their sister's doing, right? And saying, well, I, I'm not in North Carolina, I'm in Texas or I'm in you know, DC or wherever I'm at, how can we now apply some of these same processes and principles to these other locations? So when we get to that level, maybe a year, two years from now, yeah, now, now we're getting somewhere, right? Okay. Yes, sir. So Tim, this morning you talked about um, if closing the loop in terms of there is a planning database and the data house and the real prices and actually thinking about things about real data. Mm -hmm. Are you just thinking about open world? Or we absolutely are. So we have all of that data there. We, we have four or five companies right now that are engaging, those were the 12 people that are engaging with the estimating side. Even though we set it up for it to function that way, not everybody is to that level yet, right? Remember when I got this huge portfolio of you know, different levels of, of expertise here. Um, the, the top three, four, five companies, they're now diving into the estimating side and trying to make that full circle loop to do labor tracking, material tracking, uh, pricing, all of those things. Um, the next step that we're in, unlike Tim, I've got, let's take my top 10 companies, they may be all using a different ERP system, okay? Now, we've gotta figure out <laughs> how do we, how can we have a standard format that I can get this out into, right? that now that can be sucked into any ERP system that e any of these top 10 companies have. If I can, uh, the way I see this is if I can take care of the top five, six, eight, ten 10 guys, then all the rest are gonna fall into play when they finally come on board and, and do what they wanna, you know, wanna go the full circle. Yes? Per piece. Per piece, per price per piece, per piece, yes, yes. So on the sheet metal side, it's per piece, okay, based on size, okay. On piping, it's per piece, obviously, you know, four inch elbow, whatever, right. Um, labor is SMACNA uh, for us uh, in the US. We're using SMACNA labor on the sheet metal side, and we're using MCA on the uh, piping side. So the, the smaller companies don't even realize how much they need to grow to get there. <laughs> it's the bigger companies who are pushing us in the envelope to say we want all this data and they're using it and the, the other companies are just gonna get to reap the benefits when they finally get to that level, right? Okay, all done? Okay, thank you. No more questions?